Hi everyone. I think we're streaming. Hopefully. Great. Hi everyone. I'm Mandy. I'm one of the new co-owners of the new iteration of Pilsen Community Books and I am so excited that you could join us and the Chicago DSA Sochfems for our very first event. Uh, Catherine Solheim, Thomas Flynn, and I took over the store in March, and we had tons of great uh, virtual programming lined up, but obviously the world has changed very much since then, but we're very excited that we could get our Luddite selves together to go virtual, and for such an important and great cause, to raise money for the Chicago Abortion Fund, and to celebrate two great and important books, uh, Jenny Brown's Without Apology, and Choice Words, edited by Annie Finch. Uh, at a time when right-wing anti-choicers are using COVID-19 to limit abortion access, and the assumed Democratic presidential nominee, Joe Biden, may or may not support the Hyde Amendment based on the day, which of course blocks mon Medicaid funding for abortion, uh, organizing for abortion access, not just to keep Roe versus Wade in place, but fighting for free abortion on demand without apology, is as crucial as ever. Uh, the three folks joining us tonight, Megan JFO, Jenny Brown, and Annie Finch, are all at the front lines of the fight for abortion access in different ways, and I'm really, really excited to hear their perspectives. Um, as I mentioned, tonight is a fundraiser for the Chicago Abortion Fund as a part of their annual fundathon, and I'm popping a link in the chat right now where you can donate to support their great work. And if you send proof of your donation along with your mailing address to sochfem at chicagodsa.org, and we'll pop that into the chat too, um, we'll send you an assortment of buttons celebrating reproductive rights. Uh, anyone who donates this evening will also be entered into a raffle for a $100 gift card to Pilsen Community Books, where we are right now, which you could use to buy both of these books, obviously, or any of the other books in the store. Um, on our website at www.pilsoncommunitybooks.com. So a few notes about how this evening will go. Um, first up, Megan will tell us a bit about the work that Chicago Abortion Fund does, and then Jenny Brown will share a little bit about her book, Without Apology, out from Verso Books. And then Annie Finch will talk about the brand new book, Choice Words, out this month from Haymarket. Afterwards, Jenny and Annie will have a chance to discuss their work together and answer some questions from all of y'all. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the YouTube chat and we'll get to as many as we can. And now, without further ado, if I can get my computer to work, I am gonna direct it over to Megan, hopefully. One second. Aha, Megan, I found you. And here's Megan. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm good. You're okay. good. <laughs> new technology. Um, we're all learning new things. Um, first, Annie, can, am I the only one that folks can see, or can they see all three, of, all four of us? I, You're the I only can, one that folks can see, right? Okay. All right, I just want Annie to, I want to see her mug again, because it looked really cool. <laughs> Yeah, I want one of those. Um, send you a sticker. Just send me yes, stuck yes. it up for, Yeah. And I'm actually going to make these. I'm going to make these and put them on the web website that I'll tell you all about later. For those of you that can't see, she has a really awesome mug that says abortion without apology um, and some beautiful art on it. Um, but yes, like Mandy said, uh, Mandy said, my name is Megan J. Flo. I'm the executive director of the Chicago Abortion Fund and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm so thankful to Mandy, to Annie, to Jenny, to uh, Pilsen Community Books, to the Chicago DSA and really... Um, all DSA chapters have really been holding down abortion funds across the nation over the last couple of years and been um, really critical partners in our major fundraising event that um, funds across the country do every year around this time. Um, and you all have not stopped. You all um, are 
absolutely a joy to work with. We have many DSA members on our um, fundraising committee, and I'm just so thankful um, for all the work that you do because I know that this is just one of the many things that you all have your hands in. So thank you for all you do on behalf of our communities. Um, it's really great to be um, in partnership with you all. Um, and uh, the Chicago Abortion Fund, for those of you that, that don't know, we're a reproductive justice organization in Chicago, and we serve people from Chicago, um, from Illinois, from the Midwest, and um, really right now and over the last couple of years from around the country who um, come to Illinois or travel around the Midwest, and even some people who travel quite far outside of the Midwest um, with uh, financial, emotional, and logistical support and access and care. Um, and we've gone through uh, a, a really um, robust kind of growth over the last um, two years. We, um, in 2019, served 823 people, and that's compared to 180 183 in 2018. So that's almost a 400% wow. increase um, in the amount of people that we're connecting to care. Um, and we take that really seriously. And um, it's really important, especially now that we are able to continue to attempt to fund 100% of our callers, which is what we do now. Um, and so what is an abortion fund? Um, just to be super brief, we um, we give people money so that they can access the care that they need. Um, throughout COVID, um, we know that um, the same people who are, you know, um, without jobs, um, furloughed, with little children at home, um, trying to find time to get to a grocery store safely, um, people who are dependent on gig economies, we know how many people are um, financially unsupported right now. Uh, and so we have seen our calls rise um, quite a bit. And um, we're also um, we're also considering our role in this moment is to support with other things that our callers need. So we're also, we're also helping people get um, diapers, get access to contraception, um, get access to uh, gas, things that they need just to live their regular lives, not like take the abortion out of the equation. People need so much right now um, in addition to the health care that um, is being politicized around the um around the nation. Um, and so your support of CAF is so appreciated. Um, the Fundathon, like Mandy mentioned, is our annual fundraiser. We would have hoped to raise $100,000 this coming Sunday. Um, typically, uh, last year we raised $101,000. And this year we'll be really thrilled if we get to $30,000. We'll be super happy with that. Um, but uh, we do need all the support we can get. Um, if Financially contributing is not something that you can do at this time. That's completely understandable. Um, please reach out to us if you'd like to help in other ways. Um, and you can share our information. That's a huge thing. And I think Annie and Jenny will talk about this, you know, sharing things that say abortion. That means a lot. Like saying that you support abortion access. Um saying the word abortion regularly in conversation, um, that shifts culture and shifting culture um, changes how, how we see things, um, how we see things represented, um, how politicians see, see things. We, uh, Mandy mentioned Joe Biden and his like back and forth BS. People held him, you know, they held, him, they said um, when he said he was against the Hyde Amendment within what, 24 hours, he had reversed that. You know, we need to be loud and vocal about um, supporting abortion access. We need to tell our abortion stories if it's something we're comfortable with. Um, and I'm just so excited to, um, to hear you both talk about your work um, and so thankful for all of your support. It's also so strange to talk without like the, an audience that can see me. Like, so are there any not? Like, what do y'all think? <laughs> <laughs> I hope I got that through, through that okay <laughs> you did great you couldn't hear me I was like snapping over here on the side like hell yeah that was great um amazing well now I'm excited to hear from Jenny Brown I'm going to read Jenny's introduction um because it always gets me all fired up uh, Jenny Brown is a women's liberation organizer and former editor of Labor Notes magazine. She was a leader in the grassroots campaign to make the morning after pill contraception available over the counter in the U.S. and was a plaintiff in the winning lawsuit. For 10 years, she co-chaired a Labor Party chapter in Gainesville, Florida, organizing for national health insurance, the right to a job at a living, living wage, imagine that, uh, free higher education and a working person's political party under the Labor Party slogan, the corporations have two parties, we need one of our own. 
More recently, she worked as a staff writer and editor for Labor Notes magazine, covering labor struggles in hotels, restaurants, retail, farm work, airlines, telecommunications, and the building trades, and co-authored with other Labor Notes staff, How to Jumpstart Your Union, Lessons from the Chicago Teachers 2014. She is the author of Birth Strike, The Hidden Fight Over Women's Work, which is also excellent, out from PM Press, and Without Apology, The Abortion Struggle Now, out from Verso the last year. She writes, teaches, and organizes with the, National Women, with the group National Women's Liberation. Uh, thanks, Jenny. I'm so excited. It's good to see you, Mandy. I assume people can see me at this point. <laughs> um, and it's great to be with Megan and Annie to hear all the work that you all are doing um, and the Chicago Abortion Fund. Please, please give money right now is a really important time. Um, so... I, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book, and then we can go to some questions. I think one of the questions that um, a lot of people have is, that, you know, this this situation where Texas has basically banned abortion on the pretext that COVID means that um, providers will use personal protective equipment that they that wouldn't otherwise be um, available, you know. And it's uh, so we're at this moment where it's a really insane period where all of the anti-abortion stuff that they've done trying to make abortion pills less available, all of this stuff, which would actually be really helpful in this pandemic, they have, um, you know, they're, they're suddenly uh, finding that, that those restrictions are actually, are actually affecting um, what they want to do. So I, th I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, in my book, I talk about... Um, how how have we gone backwards? Like, uh, you know, uh, for people who need abortions, you know, 30% of women and others in the U.S. will get abortions, and millions more rely on it, on it as a backup to contraceptive. That should be a huge power block that, um, if it were unified, it could overrun really any opposition to abortion rights. But abortion defenders have been with two exceptions, really on the defensive and in appeasement mode. I mean, um, NARAL Pro-Choice America follows the Supreme Court's reasoning in Roe versus Wade and emphasizes privacy. Um, we should be able to make personal decisions without intrusions from politicians. Um, and Planned Parenthood, which has been obviously a target for the most attacks, um, defends itself by emphasizing its role in cancer screening and well woman care. Um, and, you know, the go-to slogan has become abortion is health care. And while it should be just seen as health care, we really need to be clear that the reason it's under attack is not because it's health care, but because, because it gives people the power to control our reproduction. Mm -hmm. um, and you could even say that abortion is our right to strike against the unfair working conditions that we face right now, bearing and raising children. And it, if the um, record low birth rate is any indication, U.S., women are on an informal birth strike right now, which might indicate why the establishment has been moving to further restrict our abortion and contraception and sex education. Um, I'll say a little more about this later, but I just want to uh, go through a brief history of um, the current strategy, how we won rights in the first place, the current strategy um, of mainstream abortion groups and, and why that might not be working. Um, so the history of legalization of abortion in the United States is often told as the Supreme Court legalized it in 1973 with Roe versus Wade. And this focus on the court has tended to cause us to kind of overvalue litigation and undervalue feminist organizing. Um, so starting in the 1950s, an abortion reform movement started uh, bumping along trying to encourage public discussion of abortion. Um, Feminist abortion strategist Lucinda Sisler writes that these folks, quote, spent a lot of time debating with priests about when life begins and which abortions are justified. She says, they're mostly doctors, lawyers, social workers, clergymen, all men, professors, writers, and a few were just plain women, usually not particularly feminist. So these groups drafted model reform laws, which created narrow exceptions to the criminal codes that banned all abortions in most states. Um, and they had won such reforms in 10 states by 1970. But these were reforms like in cases of rape, incest, or the life or the health of the mother. Um, Sisler wrote in 1970, 
Part of the reason the reform movement was very small was that it appealed mostly to altruism and very little to people's self-interest. The circumstances covered by reform are tragic, but they affect very few women's lives, whereas repeal is compelling because most women know the fear of an unwanted pregnancy and, in fact, get abortions for that reason. She says, it is the women's movement whose demand for repeal rather than reform of abortion laws has spurred the general acceleration in the abortion movement and its influence. So that's Lucinda Sisler in 1970. And her group, New Yorkers for Abortion Law Repeal, put out its own model law, which was a blank page to show the difference between reform and repeal. Um, their position was that abortion should be treated like any other medical procedure, and it shouldn't fall under any um, special law restricting when, where, how, why, or by whom it was performed, and it should be completely removed from the criminal code. Um, but because the reform proposals, these narrow exceptions to the law, helped very few people, there wasn't really a movement to push for them. The women's liberation movement was the mass movement that was needed for a break breakthrough, and after it arose, um, with demands for repeal of all abortion laws, victories came in quick succession, starting with New York State in 1970 and then nationally with the Roe decision in 1973. Um, but it was radicals in the women's liberation groups like Red Stockings that led the fight. They broke up a New York State reform hearing and demanded repeal. They held their own hearings where women testified about their illegal abortions. Every college campus had a feminist group referring people for illegal abortions or possibly legal ones in New York after 1970. In Chicago, the Jane Abortion Service did 11,000 safe but illegal abortions, and they continued even after several of them were arrested. Um, the Women's Strike for Equality in 1970 took over Fifth Avenue um, when they had three big demands. One was free abortion on demand and no forced sterilization, because, of course, at the time, sterilization was aimed at women on welfare, and in particular, black, Mexican-American, and Puerto Rican women were, um, were forcibly sterilized. Um, but also note that the demand was for free abortion. Um, so I recall this history because, you know, we are told that what we need in the abortion fight is kind of more of a professional approach, a clever legal strategy, expensive polling research, you know, a pu polished public relations, um, and plenty of donations to groups that do these things. Um, you should instead give money to the Chicago Abortion Fund. Um, abortion these recommendations have led us back to kind of emphasizing the worst case scenarios, rape, incest, health crises, um, privacy and the relationship between the patient and the doctor, and the use of confusing euphemisms to uh, avoid using the word abortion. Um, and they replay the efforts of professionals in the 1950s and 60s reform movement, and they produce similarly meager results. It was the women's liberation repeal strategy, the demand for free abortion, that won us the gains we have. And when we uh, abandoned that, we started to go backward. Um, and I don't have to tell you that we now face extraordinary obstacles. The rate of unintended births in the United States is twice that of countries with good access to abortion and birth control. And the biggest problem is price. Uh, Medicaid won't cover abortion in most states, and that hits low-wage workers and the unemployed the hardest. Then there's the long list of state restrictions, waiting periods, required ultrasounds, which require more time and drive up the price. And also, during a pandemic, uh, require more uh, contact with medical providers and more trips and and just make things worse. Um, then clinics are few and far between due to laws designed to put them out of business. Six states um, only have one remaining clinic. Um, most states have parental notification uh, or consent laws. And then there are the anti-abortion scripts that doctors are forced to read, telling patients that abortion increases their risk of breast cancer, suicide, or infertility. Um, and, of course, then we have uh, many more fake clinics run by anti-abortion zealots than we have real clinics providing uh, health care. Um, these fake clinics, often called crisis pregnancy centers, um, look like medical facilities to confuse people, but they are not medical facilities. But they now receive public funds in 14 states, and now they're receiving federal money that should go to real health care. Um, and then pill abortions have been walled up behind FDA restrictions, which make them just as expensive and inconvenient as a surgical abortion. 
And we could contrast this to a lot of other countries, but Canada, for example, abortion is free at any stage of pregnancy through the country's national health care system. Um, as the restrictions have put reproductive rights further out of reach, mainstream discussion has again focused on that other woman, the one with cancer, the one who was raped. And once again, professional experts are re devising a strategy for preserving what little we have of abortion rights. And their, uh, their arguments are often apologetic and downplay the central role of abortion and birth control in women's freedom, which I think is our strongest argument in this fight. Um, what we found when we worked uh, to win the morning after pill over the counter and, and actually had a victory in 2013 is like a 10 year battle. The same lesson can be learned also from the uh, victory in the Republic of Ireland in 2018. If we base our campaigns on going for what we really want, free abortion on demand without apology, rather than toning ourselves down, we can unite more people and we can win. Um, now, I just want to say that it's important that we have some context um, of why we are facing all these attacks right now. Um, the U.S. has the lowest birth rate it's ever had, and it's been causing a lot of concern in the establishment. In Europe, as the birth rate dropped, governments came in with more support, like universal child care, family allowances, long paid leaves for both parents. For example, in France and Sweden, you can um, basically... Uh, employers are shelling out taxes to pay for parents to stay home with their kids for over a year. Um, but in the U.S., you know, we can't even talk about paid leave for more than about two weeks and the employers start to freak out. Um, our employers are determined not to pay for work that they can extract from us for free. So instead, we face an obstacle course of increasing difficulty and expense Anytime we try to access abortion, birth control, and even basic sex education. Um, so how do we get to this point? I mean, the young radicals who started the women's liberation movement 50 years ago, didn't, they didn't expect that women would be free with capitalism intact. They were already socialists. They had risked their livelihoods and lives in the civil rights and anti-war movements. Um, and... And while men were sexist in those movements, that was not the only thing that made them start decide to start an independent movement. Um, men were sexist outside those movements, too. Many of the women's liberation pioneers said that what started them on the path to an independent movement was the example of the Black Power movement. Um, in some cases, they remember an explicit instruction to whites in the civil rights movement to go fight your own oppressors. Um, and most saw organizing for women's liberation as recruiting a new constituency to the general freedom movement while creating an independent women's power base to make sure that the rhetoric about equality and freedom for all included women. Um, well, they were right that uh, women's freedom cannot be won without confronting the power of employers and the rich. And as it turned out, the movement did make important strides, but it made those in areas that didn't cut too deeply into the prerogatives of capital and employers. Um, in that category, which we could call column A, we've made progress on appearance and dress codes, integration of all male spaces and workplaces, men doing childcare, um, better sex, to some extent, uh, divorce equality, educational equality. The areas where we're stuck or going backward, col column B, we could say, are those that require capitalists to cede control or cough up resources. Um, equal pay, public child care, paid family leave, um, universal health care, living wage jobs that allow women e economic independence from men. And half our progress towards equal pay has been a result of men's wages dropping to meet ours. And then due to the fall in the birth rate starting in the 1970s, abortion and birth control have moved from column A things that don't really um, impinge on the prerogatives of capital, to, thing, to column B, things that do. Um, and this means that feminist advance now requires a confrontation with the power of capitalists over our reproductive work. So in other words, the power structure could accommodate our demands on abortion when birth rates were already quite high, but as birth rates have dropped, they've started coming for our reproductive rights and they want our reproductive labor and they want it cheap. Um, and they, for a long time, they've been getting it cheap while we face a crisis. 
you know, even in the best conditions, um, raising children can be complicated and stressful and full of heartache. At the same time, it can be delightful, rewarding, and full of love. And then add money and time woes and partners who don't fully participate. And many are deciding against having kids or stopping at just one, resulting in what my, in my group we've been calling an informal birth strike. So um, is it enough to say that abortion is just an economic issue? Um, Nation writer Katha Pollitt writes that abortion allows women, quote, only to have the children they want and can raise well. But there's a problem with defending abortion that way, as both Red Stockings and reproductive justice advocates have been pointing out. It suggests that the solution to our economic struggles is just simply to not have kids. Um, but this is just one more way that we are expected to accommodate ourselves to an economy that stovepipes all the good things in life to the top 1% and leaves us with ashes. But this is the only solution the democratic wing of our political elite is willing to contemplate in response to the disaster that their uh, policies have made of family life. Um, creating universal child care and health care would re require redistribution of, uh, of wealth from the rich to the rest of us, so they're trying to keep that off the table. And instead, they propose tiny incremental benefits like vouchers and tax rebates or means-tested programs like Obamacare, um, meaning that you have to prove your poverty to receive the benefit. And I have been on Obamacare, and it was um, a good for me because uh, I had breast cancer when, when I was on it. But um, I still ended up with $7,000 out of pocket each year I, I had um, treatment. So it's really not enough. These are really dim horizons uh, presented by the Democratic establishment. Um, but I think we have immediate opportunities to move our feminism towards bolder, more universal demands. You know, for four decades, we've been trying to defeat Hyde Amendment restrictions on federal abortion funding to expand abortion rights. But with a growing demand for Medicare for all, we have a chance to win health care for everybody and making sure that full reproductive rights are included. And that's a lot more inspiring than trying once again to get Congress to include abortion and Medicaid, which is, after all, a means-tested program that leaves many out. Um, and a universal health care system would also mean no one would be compelled to stay in a job or marriage for health care. And, of course, you know, we see the, the uh, poverty of the, the argument that you can, um, if, you, if you like your health care, you can keep it when everybody is losing their jobs. Um, so... Um, I'll leave it there. My group, National Women's Liberation, has made a study guide for um, the, the uh, abortion book and also for our birth strike book that came out last year. Um, so if people are interested in, in either of those, they can go to womensliberation.org. Um, and uh, we're a dues-paying feminist group, so if you would like to join, please do. Um, the um, dues pay paying feminism is what made this book possible. It's not possible to write radical books and um, and really live on the proceeds um, unless you're unless you're extremely popular. Um, so that's how that happened. And we also have a Women of Color Caucus in National Women's Liberation that studies the connection between male supremacy and white supremacy. Um, so if you're interested in that, please go to our website. Um, so that's um, thanks so much for for uh, doing this event, Mandy, and and to Pilsen Community Books and you all, and give money to the Chicago Abortion Fund. Thanks, Jenny. Um, we, we dropped the link in the chat to donate to Chicago Abortion Fund again, Jenny. That was incredible. You've covered you covered so much of the landscape and of the opposition um, that we're facing today. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, Annie, uh, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Annie Finch, editor of Choice Words, Writers on Abortion, is an award-winning feminist poet, writer, and performer. Her 18 books include Spells, New and Collected Poems, and Among the Goddesses, an epic libretto in Seven Dreams, a ritual poem on abortion, which received the Sars Vati Award. Annie holds a BA from Yale and a PhD from Stanford. Based in Washington, D.C., she travels to teach and to perform her work. And a landmark literary anthology of poems, stories, and essays, Choice Words collects essential voices that renew our courage in the struggle to defend reproductive rights. 
Uh, 20 years in the making, the book spans continents and centuries. This collection magnifies the voices of people reclaiming the sole authorship of their abortion experiences. These essays, poems, and prose are a testament to the profound political power of defying shame. Uh, there's so many contributors. They're, they include Amy Tan, Anne Sexton, Audre Lorde, Bobby Louise Hawkins, Camone Felix, Diane De Prima, Dorothy Parker, Gloria Naylor, Gloria Steinem, Gwendolyn Brooks, Joyce Carol Oates, Kathy Acker, Langston Hughes, Margaret Atwood, Sharon Olds, Ursula K. Le Guin, and many, many, many more. So without further ado, I'll let Annie take it away to share a little bit more about the book. Thank you, Mandy. Hi. Um, thank you, Megan, for everything you're doing with Chicago Abortion Fund. Support Chicago Abortion Fund. I'm really, really happy to be here. And Jenny, that was amazing. Thank you for that fabulous overview and for all the work that you do. Your book is fantastic. And I'm really excited to be here with you. Um, I am uh, also excited to be launching this book. This is only the second or third event, uh, and the book did launch officially uh, like a week or two ago, and it is Choice Words, Writers on Abortion, and it took me 20 years to put together. Um, I'm going to, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. A lot of things changed during that time, and I feel that actually it's exactly in the right timing. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction to the book, a couple of pieces from it, little pieces, and then talk about uh, my experience and and why I think this, this can be a bit of a game changer, perhaps, uh, or at least a, a real contribution, because um, the literature of abortion is something we haven't really heard before. Uh, there have been you know, personal accounts about abortion. There have been speeches and a lot of um, thinking about it and and even expressing of emotion, but to actually have great writers really putting their minds to the words that will, that will express this experience, uh, to me, is a way to catapult it into a different sphere of human experience, of universally shared human experience, and uh, maybe a way to really change the conversation and uh, claim claim abortion in um, as as an experience that affects our minds, our bodies, our wills our hearts our spirits on all of these ways it affects us and because of this it is something that that no one else can really uh, uh, legislate or even comment on for I mean it's 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 ours and uh, I, I think people sometimes don't understand this and I'm hoping that this literature will, will reach out and uh, make it just um, inarguably apparent that this is a human right. Um, so I had an abortion in 1999. Searching for literature to help me absorb my experience, I realized I had rarely read anything about abortion, and I have a PhD in literature. I was astounded to discover there was no major literary anthology about one of the most profound experiences in my life and that of millions of others. A physical, psychological, moral, spiritual, and cultural reality that navigates questions of life and death and politics, abortion should be one of the great themes of literature. This book, Choice Words, is the result of the 20-year search that grew out of this initial sense of shock and loss. As I put out calls for poetry, novels, short stories, and drama, and reached out to writers and scholars for recommendations and leads, I discovered that major writers had indeed written about abortion, but that much of the literature was hard to find, unpublished, and buried within larger literary works. The project was dispiriting at times, and I had nearly given up when a traumatic presidential election that would be 2016, and an enraging Supreme Court appointment, that would be Kavanaugh, renewed my energy to complete the book. So after I realized that this book was something I really could do to change the landscape, that I could finish this book and that it would make a difference, um, 
I came up against the problem of permissions fees because normally when a book includes this many famous literary texts, the permissions fees are astronomical and it's only like a, a textbook, mainstream textbook publisher that would take it on. So um, I really, and I, Haymarket was my first choice uh, for a publisher for this book. And when I talked to them, the permissions fees were just, you know, impossible as they would be for any independent press. But um, I decided with uh, brilliant support of my very supportive husband who gets a huge uh, acknowledgement in this book that a Kickstarter might work. So I launched this Kickstarter and the day after I launched it, Alabama passed an abortion ban. We got way over like 50% more than we originally wanted within one month for the permissions, which was good because then the book expanded and it became really international and needed every penny of that for the permissions. But, but actually part of it, um, a lot of people donated in order to donate books to clinics as well. So um, they, they got their own book and they supported the permissions, but they also paid to donate copies to clinics. So that was part of the vision of this book from the beginning, that this would be a book that would have an activist focus. And um, it's, I've always thought of it as having sort of three, um, three concentric circles in terms of the effect and the uses of it. So I'm going to, I'm going to just read that part from the introduction for you. My vision for the role of choice words takes the form of three concentric circles, individual experience, collective understanding, and social change. On the individual level, I hope the book will be helpful to people who are dealing with abortion in our own lives or who seek to understand it more deeply, offering compassion, support, companionship, and insight. No matter where you are on this issue, may this book bring you closer to understanding that people who have abortions are full human beings. If you are reading this book in a reproductive health clinic waiting room, Thanks to the nearly 500 backers who supported a Kickstarter campaign, donating copies to clinics. Even if you have only a few minutes, here's hoping you'll open the books to some words that will focus your mind, soothe your heart, or strengthen your will. And Meg and I would love to make sure we donate some copies to clinics that would be important to you. That would be amazing. On the level of collective understanding, I envision choice words as a source of knowledge and illumination with and between cultures and literatures. Sorry, within and between cultures and literatures. Even those who don't normally read much literature will find a wealth of human connection in these pages, stories about lives that matter to us, poems that express feelings we need to understand more deeply, plays and essays that lay out urgent new ways of contextualizing our lives and thoughts. Um, and then we go on to talk about just the way that this is an entirely new canon of literature, really, and the intersections among texts are really amazing, too. Like, um, just when you have writers responding to something like uh, Richard Brattigam's poems, of, uh, his writing about abortion, The Spill Pill versus the Spring, there's a wonderful response to Richard Brattigam's uh, infamous novel about abortion here, for example, um, and tributes from writers to other writers. Uh, on the level of the third level of the third concentric circle, the level of social justice and reproductive rights, I hope this book will provide a focal point for community organizing and activism. Many are beginning to recognize that control of sexual and reproductive autonomy is integrally related to other forms of authoritarianism and exploitation. Choice words can be used as a topic for book club discussions as we take the first step towards change. Raising awareness it can, the first step towards change, raising awareness. It can be used as a source text for abortion healing circles and consciousness raising groups as we take the next step towards change, healing ourselves. And it can be used as the focus of community discussions across ideological lines or as a source of readings performed at fundraisers and performances and other events as we move forward together into action. So the individual the knowledge of the of culture and then the social action 
And um, this is already happening. And when the book came out, um, a wonderful volunteer came forward and has started a website called choicewordsaction.org, which is uh, like a meetup where anybody who's reading this book and wants to, say, have a book discussion or a performing, like a sort of vagina monologue style performance as a fundraiser or just like um, a, a get together or a, a postcard writing campaign where you take quotes from the book and put them on postcards or, you know, any of the ways this book could be used around organizing um, that they could get out the word at this website, choicewordsaction.org, and find other people in their area. Once we're back in our neighborhoods again, you can find people um, in your area. So part of my hope is to get women talking with each other because so many of us, I mean, uh, Jenny used the, the statistic 30% of women have abortions, and so many of those women in every country are not talking about that and not talking with each other about that. And I think that this is one of the unspoken sources of women's uh, disempowerment is that we keep these this secret, so many of us, that we're ashamed, afraid to, to share, to connect with other women about. And this, this creates like a wall in the area where we should be most intimately connected and most trusting of each other. And I think it really damages women's solidarity in ways that we might not even recognize yet. So I hope that this book will begin to start some of those conversations and, you know, allow an opening point. The sections in the book are all short, even the, the parts from novels and essays um, and plays are, they're, they're like little gems that I pulled out. There are um, 140 different pieces in here, and most of them are just a few pages long, so it's, um, and then the poems, of course, tend to be shorter, so it's a combination of um, you know, there's, there's a tweet, even like a tweet storm. There's this, uh, some amazing stuff in, in here, such a variety. And um, I divided it over the years that it took me to edit this, as I said, 20 years. Um, at the beginning, I was, I, I thought, you know, I, I guess I thought I would organize it chronologically because it does cover five centuries of writing, which is fascinating. People like uh, Mary Wollstonecraft and Dorothy Parker and the medieval ballad of Tamlin, I mean, all going far back. And then um, a lot of 20th century stuff. And it covers there were six continents. We have writers from uh, so many different countries from um, Bulgaria, China, England, Finland, India, Iran, Ireland, Kenya, Northern Ireland, Pakistan, Romania, Saudi Arabia, Scotland, South Africa, Sudan, and Syria, as well as the U.S. So, of course, there's an amazing variety of approaches and issues that, that come up and the intersections between, say, class, religion, um, race and um, family background, education, the way all of these things intersect with abortion in these different cultures. It's remarkable to see the similarities and the parallels. Um, and as you, go, you also see that the issues are very different. Like, for example, many of the women from India are writing about forced abortion that they're trying to avoid. So it's very apparent that it comes down to autonomy and freedom um, you know that that needs to just be a, a fundamentally recognized human right so um, all of these things together just I think they, they give a sense of even though it's it's kind of hard to read it all it can give a sense of empowerment that um, that we, we do have the power to shape abortion the way we want it to be. It is so different in different cultures, and the, the experiences here are so different that um, it gives a sense that, you know, it's malleable. There's nothing universal about any of it. There's nothing that's um, unavoidable about any of it. We can, we can do it the way we want. Um, it's divided into these five sections, and as I said, at one point I might have wanted to do it chronologically, but by the time I finished it 20 years later, um, I had a lot more experience living as a woman, and I had realized that um, for for me thinking about thinking about my life, I found a structure that for me is um, it's a structure that I use in spirituality, and that it was really helpful also to think about different areas in my life. It's the structure of a sacred circle where you have the, the directions and each direction brings in an important aspect of experience that otherwise you might 
you know, you might forget. So I ended up just uh, organizing this book into five sections, like the directions of a sacred circle. So there is the mind, the body, the heart, the will, and the spirit. And each of these have a very different um, approach towards abortion. So the mind is pieces about uh, decision making and, you know, all the all the different things that come into uh, having an abortion. Amy Tan's amazing uh, novel excerpt about a servant girl who's impregnated by um, by her master in 18th century China. Um, Margaret Drabble's classic um, Anna Gabriela Rivera from contemporary Guatemala. Um, just a great variety of women addressing the the mind aspects of it. Then you have the body aspects, which of course are incredibly varied over centuries and continents. Then the heart, the relationships that women have, how important that is, the support systems, the emotional repercussions of silence and shame. Um, Then the will has some amazing political manifestos and uh, pieces about um, like Audre Lorde's uh, excerpt from her memoirs in there about having an abortion in the 50s when she was 18 years old or whatever, and it's the the willpower that she had, so moving. Um, and then the, the final section is spirit, which has um, some of the pieces that were the hardest to find and I think may be useful for for people who have had an, uh, an abortion or, or want to have an abortion in a new kind of a way, just looking at the intersection between spirituality and religion and abortion and, and how it is possible to really create different kinds of contexts spiritually for the experience and how empowering that can be for people who, who need that. So um, this, is, this is it. I'm going to read um, just a little piece by... Um, Busiswe Malangu, who is a very young poet from South Africa. At night, I hug my body to sleep, just to feel like it belongs to me. Body has been dragged through mud with a million hands grabbing their own pieces. Body has been talked down into a hole by a thousand mouths, each taking a bite. Body is exhausted of searching for ways to be mine. But there are many ways, I whisper, I love you to it. Sometimes the whisper is a loud bang of protest. Other times the whisper is just silence. In this ugly world, any whispering black woman is a danger to herself. You should swallow a storm. You should eat the wind. Any way to lock the voice in your throat. Somewhere a law is written against my body. Here I give my body all the love I have. I eat as much fried chips as I can. I stay up all night watching movies. I walk into a hospital and terminate a pregnancy I don't need. I don't explain to anyone why I did it. There are only a few words to say I did it for life. I don't explain to anyone why I did it. There isn't enough time for them to see that the life I speak of is mine, that I was alive before the abortion and I am alive now. That, too, is a life blessing. When the world crumbles with their insults again, I whisper to the empty space in my womb, this is love, this is love, this is love, too. This is my poem from the book. It's in two voices, the voice of the mother and the voice of the baby, and then they speak together. An abortion day spell for two voices. As I turn your blood back to the earth, I am life, you are death, and we kiss through the fire that is my freedom's birth. By the womb of our love's endlessness, as you turn my blood back to the earth, I am death, you are life, and we kiss. As we move through the deep, giving forth to the web that is love-woven bliss by the fire that is our freedom's birth. Thank you. And donate to the Chicago Abortion Fund. (laughs) Thank you so much, Annie, and thanks to all of the people who contributed to that wonderful book. Um, As Megan mentioned, the more we share 
our stories, the more we say the word abortion, the more we reduce the stigma and the shame around this, uh, the, the more we all get free. Um, again, we're going to post the link in the chat. I, and so Annie and Jenny mentioned that you guys might want to talk to each other. We also have a couple questions here from the chat that we can address. Um, we have about five minutes. So what I can do, if you want, is read a couple of the questions out and you two can address the ones you feel like you have time for. Does that sound all right? Mm -hmm. All right. So a couple of the questions. Um, and I think, Jenny, you touched on some of these in your talk, but I'll read them out again. Um, can you talk about the class dynamics when the issue is framed as personal choice, government intrusion, and liberty? And could you talk about how opposition to abortion reinforces militarism worldwide? And then also we had another person um, who wanted to know more about the intersections of gender identity and reproductive health care in history, uh, politics, etc. So, um, Annie, I'm going to make uh, put you both on the screen, just FYI, and feel free to answer any of those questions that feel like they speak to you. Well, I can go first. Um, so, uh, the question about militarism. Um, so, my book in my book, Birth Strike, I go through the various reasons um, why establishment. Uh, politicians and and uh, basically the 0.01 percent want more births in the United States, and uh, the main reason is that they want more economic growth. Um, w one of the main contributors to economic growth is is uh, population growth, and we're about to have um, because our our birth rate has has gotten to a record low. They're worried about that, but they're also worried about filling the military. Um, and so that is definitely a factor. And throughout history, um, you know, kings have wanted larger populations so that they can recruit people and send them into battle to for the to grow their their kingdoms. And so it's it's still happening today. So that's one thing. Um, on the on the gender identity thing, I would just say that one of the things that we see about where they're where the right is really trying to um, uh, push people into uh, heterosexual relationships where they have children. Um, one of the th one of the attacks has been on uh, trans folk, um, and it it's also against queer folk of all kinds. Um, but it is partly because they want to increase the birth rate. That is one of the motivations, um, and I think it's really clear if you read like Rick Santorum, who is the Pennsylvania s senator, who is really um, you know, to start talks about how basically they want to, and this is true of Jeb Bush too, they really want to push people back into this nuclear family um, of their making, you know, and not how we want to make families. So I think those are, those are a couple of thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, it, it's very interesting in here that um, some of the writers who were most courageous early in say the 20th century to speak out, about abortion were um, were people who were uh, like say Dimfna Cusack in Australia. I mean, who were I don't know if they would have called themselves non-binary at the time, but were clearly pushing against traditional um, gender identities. And I think there's you know just the freedom to define ourselves is uh, abortion is a key part of that and gender. Uh, flexibility, you know, uh, is, is a key part of that as well. So it, it all comes down to uh, being able to really define who we are. Um, I, one of the books I found most interesting while I was getting this book together was um, called The Serpent and the Goddess. It's a history of the colonization of Ireland in the medieval times over about a thousand year period. And basically, the, the first line of attack that they used to go from the indigenous culture of Ireland, which was a culture where women's sexuality was totally celebrated and people, you know, there was space for like uh, trans non-binary non identities within the culture. They got from that to the repression of, um, of the Middle Ages and the, but a combination of capitalism, nationalism, 
and the church, and it was really targeted at reproductive freedom. I mean, that was like the first thing they did was was start to chip away at abortion rights. And you can just see the parallels between how that played out in Ireland, which is, you know, recorded history and and the kinds of um, strategies that are being used now to control reproductive rights and reproductive freedom. Cool, I think we have time for one more question. Um, he says, someone requests uh, a comment on pending U.S. Supreme Court decision, June Medical Services versus Rousseau, given stepped-up assaults, uh, whether in person at the federal court building as planned, we can respond in mass. Um, and I think that's a question of tactics and how we respond. Do either of you have thoughts on that? Well, it's really tough right now in a pandemic to figure out how we can mobilize um, in an effective way. So I, I really don't have a good answer for that. Obviously, um, if we are uh, at a point when that decision is, is, I mean, they've already done the hearing, so, um, so presumably they will come down with the decision. I'm a little afraid that they are going to take the advantage of the pandemic and do the decision when we're all supposed to still stay at home. So, um, you know, for good reason to stay at home, but uh, nonetheless, that they might be able to sneak it through when everybody's not paying attention. Um, that decision would uh, would allow Louisiana and, by extension, other states to um, to basically make uh, make it hard for doctors to perform abortions because they wouldn't be able to get admitting privileges, and so we would be in a position where a lot of states would have no abortion available no surgical abortion available, and frankly, no abortion available at all, because um, abortion pills have been so bound up by, um, by the anti-abortion movement that we, you know, even though it would be very easy, especially in a pandemic, for people to go to their pharmacy and get an abortion pill, we can't do that because there are so many restrictions on abortion pills, um, and uh, doctors have to provide them um, which means that if a doctor does not have admitting privileges at a hospital um, and they are banned through this this Russo decision, um, then they won't even be able to hand a pill to somebody, which is ridiculous. And it, the ridiculousness of it is being, uh, I think, highlighted by the pandemic, where it will be s great if if people could have access to to abortion pills and not have to travel 13 hours to get abortions. Yeah. One of the most accessible things that everyone can do is to break the silence. I mean, we need to make it clear that abortion is normal, uh, abortion without apology, and we're going to have these mugs for uh, available at yes, Choice we have, Action. We have, or, we have a matching button yeah, that we... <laughs> we both have them. There you go. So that's, this is through uh, choicewordsaction.org, and where's that one? Oh, this is uh, National Women's Liberation. We made this button to go with the... With, uh, to, to go with the book, yeah. Fabulous, yeah. And just, you know, choicewordsaction.org has, it really has a lot of ideas. There's a toolkit you can download. There's also a discussion guide you can download for this book. If you want to start your own discussion circle, if you want to uh, use the book for organizing purposes, like, um, you know, use it as a, as, a, as a center of rallying and things like that, you can get the toolkit for the organizing written by um, Ash Jordan, Ashley Jordan, who started the uh, choicewordsaction.org website. So um, really just breaking the silence and connecting with others and making it clear that abortion is normal. This is, you know, it's not an extra thing to do to talk about it in this way. It's actually an essential thing to do. It's like a core thing to do. We need to change the conversation and then the politics will follow. So even if we're not out there on the steps of the Supreme Court, which is where we were with the day, because I live in D.C., we went out there and launched Choice Words Action on the steps of the Supreme Court. But, you know, you can be anywhere and you can have these conversations just with people that you know or start your own little Zoom group. Um, and that is revolutionary and that's going to make the real change because, you know, when as, as Jenny said, the block, uh, well, you started out by saying that enough women have had abortions that this could be if there was this kind of unity it, it could be a block of a political block that could not be um resisted but that in order for that to happen we need to come out and speak 
up and be open and support each other and talk with each other and read this great literature and, and just see who else has been there before and what they wrote, what they thought about it, and, and just really just get out there with our minds, with our words, with our hearts, with our bodies, with our wills, and just make it clear this is, you know, it's not a little secret that hides deep inside us somewhere. This is us. This is our lives. This is just, it's just normal. It's who we are. So nothing to be embarrassed by. So let's just, you know, let's just let's enjoy <laughs> the beautiful writing in this book and enjoy the great ideas that Jenny has had and support Donate to Chicago Abortion Fund. <laughs> and, right. Uh, yeah. And, and thank you, Mandy and the DSA, who's doing amazing stuff for all of this. So I think it's starting to bubble up, you know, but um, we, we can make it really start to bubble big. Like, what else can we do, right? I mean, that's right. all we can do. Yeah, and um, you know it would be a good combination for uh, for a study group. The uh, the two books that we're talking about tonight. Um, uh, we also have a study guide that has consciousness raising questions, so you can go around and talk about your experiences with sex, abortion, contraception, all of the obstacles to healthcare. Um, and uh, so I recommend that to um, the uh, uh, you can. Find our guide on whimsliteration.org, and uh, and thanks so much to to Mandy and for um, uh, for organizing this, and uh, to Megan and Annie for participating. And please give money to the Chicago Abortion Fund. It will help a person get an abortion that will change their life. It's really really important. And Mandy, can they order both books through Pilsen Books? And is it possible they could get a little discount if they order both books? And then they could get both discussion guides. And you're right, Jenny, it would be a rocking discussion group to have them together. Yes, they can order bo both through uh, Pils Community Books, www.pilscommunitybooks.com. And I think that is a great idea, Annie. So, uh, yeah, if you want to order the books, uh, order, you can order through our website. Um, also, please donate to the Chicago Abortion Fund um, and send that mailing address to the email address in the chat. You'll get buttons. This is one of them, free abortion on demand without apology. Um, you'll also be entered to get that $100 gift card, so you may not even have to buy them at all. Um, but I want to thank Jenny and Annie. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. And Megan, thank you so much for the work you do. I know you had to pop off, but um, I'm so excited that or I'm so grateful that we could all come together um, to be in communion with one, with one another and remind each other that we're not alone and we're going to continue the fight. Um, so check out all the links in the chat. There's tons of good stuff, tons of study guides, um, tons of people doing great work. And until we see each other again, uh, stay strong. <laughs>